All right, everybody, welcome back from break. Uh, my name is Tim Carroll. I used to run the high performance computing and AI teams that were responsible for supporting our public sector and research customers. Uh, and I have moved into a new role uh, here, running point for all of our uh, weather and climate capabilities and solutions moving forward out of the engineering team. Um, but anybody that understands those workflows under, uh, realizes that the two are very closely related. High performance computing is probably going to be uh, one of, if not the single most important tool in order to equip our customers, both public sector and commercial, uh, with the tools they need to address uh, near-term extreme weather events and then also some of the closer-term impacts of, uh, of a changing climate. Um, but that's not the topic of discussion today. So um, <clears throat> I had the, depends on your perspective, either the enviable or the unenviable task of tackling the question about cloud versus on-prem, right? And uh, I'll just say it, it is, for the most part, an unsolvable riddle, right? Which is probably why they gave it to me. So I'm going to start off with one basic premise to this, um, and it, and it, it, it traces back to what I had just talked about what my new role is, which is addressing uh, uh, weather and, and near-term climate issues. Quite frankly, I don't really care where you run your stuff, right? I've been doing this for a long time, about 20 years almost in the HPC space. Um, and if you are running important work, I don't care if you run it on your Xbox. What's most important is that you get the work done, right? And that's going to temper a lot of the discussion today that I think that one of the things that has happened along the way is that we get caught up and distracted in this whole on-prem versus cloud question because we were trying to dis distill it down and define it in what were 10 year ago, you know, 10 year old terms. So what I hope to be able to do today is to reframe that discussion a little bit so that we can really get down to what's the problem we're really trying to solve for? Is it the riddle of, hey, what's better or what's more expensive or much, what's more whatever, cloud versus on-prem? Or is it, hey, what's the best thing for us to do to maximize the amount of dollars that we've got to figure out how to go get done as much important science as we need to do? Um, you know, And I understand that we've got, on the call today, we've got people from the energy sector, from high ed, from healthcare, from financial services, you know, everyone, and, and, and across that spectrum, we're not only representing different constituencies of domain science, but also different types of workloads that do use the infrastructure differently, which also is going to impact the individual conversations that you're even having in terms of how your whether your workflow would run better on cloud or run on-prem. So the only other rule for today, um, if there if it even is a rule, is that a lot of times, especially in the era of COVID, uh, it's save your questions till the end because we're trying to navigate the tools and teams and all the rest of the stuff. Uh, that doesn't work today, and it doesn't work with what we're going to try to accomplish over the next half hour, 45 minutes or so. Uh, so my good friend Kevin Rains is going to be monitoring the, the question board, um, and I've been at Microsoft for about four years, and, and Kevin has felt free interrupting me for all four of those years. So when you ask a, a compelling question, uh, not not even a compelling question. When you ask a question online, it'll be from you to Kevin to me right away so that we're not pulling these questions at the end. And it's also not, doesn't have to be a question. If you disagree with what I'm saying or want me to clarify, I am happy to stop and go back because this conversation is for you to get out of it what you need, not for us to get through the content uh, that we hope to deliver. Right, so if you've got a question, comment, statement, objection, anything, please feel free to go ahead and uh, put it in the chat window, and Kevin's going to go ahead and, and uh, interrupt me real time, um, but always diplomatically. Kevin's very nice when he does it. All right, so I grew up in a dinner table of seven of us around the table, and one of the ways that you uh, kept order was that you weren't allowed to answer a question with a question. So if somebody asked you a question, you had to give an answer, you weren't allowed to ask them a question back. Because if you do that with seven people around the table, it turns into bedlam, right? We're going to violate that rule today, right? Because the real challenge that we get, uh, and this has always been the HPC thing, right? I mean, for, you know, for the 20 years that I've been doing this, 
the answer to 99.4% of the questions that get asked are, it depends. And then it requires two or three follow-up questions to figure out how to provide context for the, the answer. So when we talk about what's the question, when somebody says, well, when somebody asks me, hey, so you know, help me understand what's better. Should I be running this on cloud or should I be running it on my on-prem instances? Um, you know, the first question that I ask is not about hardware configuration. It's really what's the real problem that you're trying to solve for, right? And fundamentally, when you get down to it, most of the people, if they're talking to us and they're talking cloud people, it's because they have a problem they need to solve that they're not sure whether or not they're going to be able to address that problem with the on-prem infrastructure they've got either the configurations that they have uh, or the, the amount of capacity of those configurations, right? So, hey, I'll do the reverse interrupt. I know that Kevin doesn't want to be on camera for the whole thing, so if, Ke if Kevin's on camera, you can kill him. There we go. And Rachel's stalking us even though she's on jury duty right now. So that's a devoted HPC team at Microsoft here for you. So anyway, here's the, uh, here's the next question that a lot of times when people say, and let me back up for a second. Uh, I will spare you reading my resume. You're sitting in a computer. You can probably go hit me up on LinkedIn and figure out where I've been. Uh, I've got some track record in this space. I ran Dell's HPC business globally for uh, a little over seven years. I left uh, Dell to go um, to cycle computing which was at the time we were a 35 person shop that had a great piece of software to be able to take and migrate and orchestrate workflows from the on-prem clusters that I'd spent 10 or 15 years building to then be able to run them in Azure, AWS, and Google. And we were acquired by, my, acquired by Microsoft four years ago. So my perspective on this, I have more time talking to customers about solving their customers or solving their challenges with on-prem uh, solutions than I do in cloud. We're getting close. I left in 2013, so the cutoff point is getting close. But when I talk, I really talk from the perspective of somebody that was came up through the infrastructure side and was really proud of the work that we did getting compute into the hands of people who needed it for a long time. And I know that, that, that those, not just the infrastructure, but the organizations that support them are indispensable to continuing to support the research community in both the public and, and commercial sector, right? So when I answer these questions or I point out things that are gonna be important, it really comes from understanding just how hard this job really is, right? How hard the job of being an on-prem center director, system administrator, uh, and line of business person that's trying to get this work done. So when I say that the next question is, are you really prepared to do some work in order to get the, the uh, answer that enables your decision? It's really important. This is not like the old days where you could just go to the three hardware providers, tell them what you wanted to solve for, and then they could go price out a configuration or a widget and come back, you threw it into a spreadsheet and we're able to do some comparisons. We just don't have that luxury anymore because cloud is a moving target, right? In terms of what the cost structures are, depending on both what's available as infrastructure, but also what's required to run the workflow sense of urgency and all these other things. So just the pricing mechanisms of cloud are very, very difficult to pin down. And then you take trying to get to a true cost of what your internal infrastructure is. And we've been talking about that for years and years. And so we're not gonna solve for it today, but just bear in mind that there's a lot of flexibility in terms of pe how people are able to not just uh, uh, quantify, but how can they can actually track their real on-prem cost, right? So the, the on-prem cost of this is not, it's not for today to debate, but just bear in mind that it's, you gotta be careful about leaning too hard on the number that you've got um, if, it's, if it's gonna have to circulate all the way up through finance. And so Kevin, I think we have two questions. Was there anything you wanted to? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw out the first one and then when you finish, I'll, I'll give you the second one. So the first question is, can you comment on how you see HPC capacity increase versus the climate and weather modeling demands? Yes. Um, so I don't think, uh, it actually, I'll answer this, this, it's actually a really good question um, because it, it's analogous to on-prem, 
right? So I'll just go back and and tell a little story about what got me to the to the weather and climate piece. I was I was working um, with Duke University and Dr. Randalls on a project during COVID in order for, she had a, somebody on her team who had come up with a really innovative approach um, to building a device to do ventilator splitting at a time when those were desperately needed, that, that capability was desperately needed. And uh, she reached out to us because she needed to do about 800,000 hours, uh, uh, 800, hours of compute in order to run the simulations to be able to put the packet together for the FDA to, to, uh, to do an emergency submission to FDA. And uh, Charlie Niefel, who runs the on-prem infrastructure at Duke and does a remarkable job uh, you know, draining every ounce of efficiency out of the uh, implementation that he's got, out of the infrastructure that he's got, the challenge was going to be not necessarily could we go find 800,000 hours on the system that they had, but they had so many other users that were on it. Were they going to be able to get those other users off fast enough in order to enable Dr. Randalls to do the work that she needed to do? So we got a call on a Wednesday afternoon, and fast forward by Sunday night, we had been able to get that simulation. Her folks worked with our folks We got it, and Charlie's team. We got it teed up. We ran it, and we had the results back by Sunday night. And the thing was, was that not only were we able to get the results run, but there wasn't a single researcher through the rest of the university who was impacted. And there were other re researchers doing work that was just as important, right? So, so in terms of asking, is there going to be enough capacity in the cloud? And I say cloud, you know, we're going to live in a multi-cloud world. So you take the aggregate capacity of all of the clouds that are out there, you could probably do the math and say there might be enough to do the all of the simulations that are going to be required, but the practicality of people, everybody within the weather and climate community being able to get what they need when they need it is still going to be challenged for a couple of years. And so it's going to require close planning between the people that are running those workflows and the cloud provider that they're working with, the folks at Azure, to make sure that we're still planning for that. This The cloud's not instant on demand. Um, and so my my answer to that would be we're going to have when you take the aggregate capacity of on-prem systems today, the incremental capacity uh, represented by cloud, you're probably looking at about a 4x capacity increase available to the weather and climate community. Um, and you know, our back of the napkin calculations were you know, that if it was free, they could probably use about 12x. Um, but given budgets and everything else, it's probably going to be 6x or so. So... I think we will continue to make strides in getting the capacity that people require, but this is a problem that um, it will we'll never have enough. Um, Kevin, do you want to ask the second question now? Yeah, second question. So when a user comes to the Azure HPC platform, what is the most common path to help that user select the suitable resources for their needs, uh, such as is it cost, speed? Uh, <laughs> is it through benchmarking data, tooling, architectural support? On right. On. All right. Everyone all together, it depends, right? So he, here's the the big piece of this. So, and I tell you what, I'm going to answer that question. Let me just these last two bullets because they're they're actually relevant to the question that was just asked. Um, so a lot of times when people are doing the calculations where they're trying to figure out um, uh, where they're trying to figure out what cost is going to be, et cetera, there are you have to be careful of your point in time calculation. Right? Are you trying to figure out, so let's take the question that was just asked about weather and climate codes. Are we talking about the work that we're doing today? Are we talking about the work that we're doing in 18 months? Or are we talking about the work of what this is going to look like in four years? Right? Because if we're talking about work that's going to be, let's say, two years out, then we have to think about what's the platform that it's actually going to be running on in two years. If it's on-prem, it's most likely going to be what's already there. But if not, it's probably going to be do a change during a changeover to a new system, and if it's uh, on cloud, it's going to be same network, probably same storage, um, but maybe you know you probably have a few more node or compute selections at different price points than you have today. So just that part is the is just that is the variable of when you feel you're going to run those workflows and over what period of time. And then the last question is not as squishy as it sounds, right? It's the, 
do you trust your vendor, right? And the reason that I say, do you trust your vendor is because I don't think that we, well, I know we don't, but I don't think our competitors do. Nobody's gonna sit down and fabricate numbers just to make their stuff look better. Because guess what happens? Then once you get that all those systems deployed and you wind up being twice as expensive as you said you were gonna be, that's a big problem, right? So for the most part, you're getting, you're gonna get the best answers that the that whoever you're working with is capable of giving you. But the challenge is gonna be, you're gonna just need to take a leap of faith on some things. And so when I say, do you trust your vendor? It's really, do you trust your vendor to have command over the environments they've got and the information that they're giving you um, and that they're doing their best to include all of the costs in there that are gonna be incurred? Because I know that one of the things that happens with us when we put, um, when we try to go through these exercises with customers, you know, we tend to um, come up with a number uh, that's slightly higher than what the customer had calculated, oftentimes because they're not figuring in things that we know they're gonna use, that because they haven't been operational yet, they haven't run into. It might be some tool relative to storage, it might be some aspect of network or whatever else it is, right? And so um, you also want to make sure that whoever you're working with is is including everything that you're going to need in order to run the entire workflow, rather than just dialing down and focusing on that compute node and that type of storage and that network, right? Because the, there can be incremental costs that are non-trivial, especially when you're operating at the scale um, that we operate, right? So I'll so I'll rotate back or I'll roll back and answer the question that you asked. And I will say, you know, and, and this is an Azure presentation, right? So um, I will say that one of the things that I like about what we do and how we do it and how it differentiates us is that when you sit down to work through what's gonna be the right place to run the workflow that you've got, um, you have a team of people at Microsoft who are HPC people most of whom had their, um, you know, spent their formative, the formative parts of their career in the on-prem side, so they understand your environments, and then we just iterate through. And it doesn't, it's not an eight-hour whiteboarding session, it's usually an hour, hour and a half of working through what are all the aspects of the workflow that you're looking at, and then we make sure, just to the point that I was previously making, that all those little pieces that we include are in there, Right, in terms of giving you at least a rough order of magnitude sense of what it's going to take in terms of people's time and then cost in order for you to run these workflows uh, in Azure. The nice thing about that exercise is that when we used to do that on the hardware side, then the next step was, oh, okay, so let's see if we can't find a couple of test servers and I'll call my friend over at Mellanox, and maybe they'll send you a couple of IB cards and you can stick them in the back in your rack, blah, 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 the whole thing. And we weren't able to validate any of that work until we got all that infrastructure set up, or maybe you know, in our test labs, we ran that on a very similar configuration. But it was still typically weeks, if not months, before you took the output of the whiteboard session and it turned into real data for you. Um, oftentimes what we're able to do is once we've come up with what it is that we wanna do, um, we really just need a day or so um, and not to do anything from an HPC perspective, but oftentimes it's just setting up um, tenants and, and other work that needs to happen in, at an IT level in terms of security and subscriptions and the other pieces to just get uh, the, the user ready to go. And so oftentimes we'll go through that, that whiteboard session and within a matter of days, you have the output from the configuration that we've selected. And not only do you see your performance, but you can also do a cost calculation off of it. And so this is an incredibly important point to take with you out of today, is that you're gonna get tired of me saying, um, it's all about the workflow, but that's because it's all about the workflow, right? And so that if you're trying to figure out what it's gonna take to run on-prem versus cloud, the best thing that I can do to help you is to take the workflow that you wanna run not uh, a project in abstract where you're telling me, well, I think we're gonna use this core type. Give me a workflow. Give me a workflow, let us run that. So you now know what your performance was and what your price is, 
And that's everything that we do in HPC is a metric of price and performance and then and sense of urgency and the other pieces that go along with it. And then that's a piece of data that I can stand behind. I have no control over whether or not I have visibility to or I know that your internal numbers are accurate or anything else. So all I can do is trust that if I give you that data, if I do that workup for you and give you that data, that you'll then go compare it with what you're able to do internally, and then you can make your own business decision. Um, but there's not really, it's, it's very, very difficult to do a bake-off of any kind without doing the work that you just described in that question. How are we doing, Kevin? You got anything else? Yeah, I got another one for you. So other than CFD, what other workloads do you see there being an increase in adoption of AI or at least exploration? Um, uh, excellent. All right. So uh, everybody already knows the, the marketing slide. Everybody already knows this marketing slide. You wouldn't be here, right, if you didn't. Fixed capacity on-prem, here's the cloud, all that good stuff. That's if you need to convince an executive, right? That's the executive slide right there. So everybody on this, everybody on this uh, I, I apologize for insulting people with this slide, right? But this is why I do what I do, right? So to, to the question that you just asked about, other than CFD, where do you see AI coming in? Let me cite another example of a workflow that we just, um, actually that we're doing the AI work for, um, I think we started, but in any event, there's a, if you go out and search on it, uh, there's a, um, uh, Chris Massey is a principal investigator down with uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and he's on the civilian side of US Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, it was actually the distinction of being the last in-person meeting I had before COVID was sitting down with Chris and with Carol Wartman from uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, at Eric, and we were in a conference room in Atlanta. And basically what happened was, and this speaks to a couple of things that we're talking about today, that Chris has a model called C Storm, capital C Storm. And essentially what it does is it is a um, full-scale intensive model of the um, uh, coastland, coastland and inner, uh, inland waterways, uh, pushing up into inland waterways. And what it does is that it measures the impact uh, of storm, storm surge and to a certain extent, sea level rise. And the reason that uh, Army Corps of Engineers has it is that as they're understanding optimal placement for levees, berms, other physical structures that they may require, that was really the genesis of this. But as you can imagine, it's got a, a bunch of different uses and the value of the output is pretty, pretty extraordinary. The challenge is, it is a, uh, actually I'll use the diplomatic term, it is computationally intense, right? Not, that's not the phrase I would normally use in mixed company, but the, um, it's computationally intense, which means that Chris, even though um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is homed at ERDIC, which is part of the High Performance Computing Modernization Office, who has, you know, uh, arguably the most sophisticated um, uh, and efficient uh, set of HPC resources for the Department of Defense uh, uh, of any organization. And Chris was struggling to get the capacity that he needed to run this model beyond just the southeastern United States, which is basically sort of hurricane country, right? But with the climate changing, um, there was a sense of urgency to get this run for the East Coast all the way up through um, the northernmost part of the Eastern Coast, right, to see what the impact of that was going to be. So there was really two parts, and this goes to the AI question. The first part that we helped Chris out with was the easy part. We wrote a check and gave free credits to be able to, rather than Chris, let's go back to Dr. Randall's the Dr. Randall's problem of it's not just whether or not there's enough cores, it's whether it's who needs to get pushed off the machine for you to get the cores that you need to run the workflow. Basically what we did was we supplied enough compute capacity for Chris to be able to run this model all the way up through the Eastern US um, without needing to impact any of the other users on the system. So first thing we did was we took the model and we ported it from the uh, Cray that they were running on and then we ported it over so that we were running it on the uh, the most efficient uh, Azure instance type for it. And then we ran that through. But the fact of the matter is that um, 
and this goes to this cost question, right? It's so computationally intense that it is really cost prohibitive for anybody else to be able to do that, right? And we weren't going to be able to continue subsidizing it. So the really, really cool part of this project is that Chris wants to take AI, ML, other techniques to be able to reduce the amount of the input decks that are going into the models themselves so that we can compute against far less data in order to get the same amount of, or in order to get the same valuable output. And by reducing the amount of data that we need to compute, A, we're moving less data from point A to point B, which is good for people who don't have the networks to move that kind of data from point A to point B, but there's also a significant cost component. And then the cost component of the compute itself. And by us being able to use uh, AI and, and ML to be able to bring down both of those dollar amounts, we now make this model, and it's very much what Chris wants to do, is make this model available to other organizations um, to, to be able to run it themselves. Now we can get it down to a price point where they're going to be able to as a result of that. So I think that uh, CFD is an obvious place where people are going. Climate's going to be big. I think anywhere that you've got very large amounts of data where we traditionally would have just taken that and just jammed it all through CPU compute, or then people started saying, well, what if we just roll that over and we recompile and run on GPUs? We're just running that now in a more, more efficient compute pattern but, uh, problem, but we're, it's still brute forcing it. Using AI and ML is actually, I think, going to be long-term a more elegant and more cost-effective way for us to be able to run the really big models, regardless of, of what their function is. So, but physics, physics, physics. Anything else, Kev? Yeah, one more question. So, is Azure HPC fully connected to the Azure network ba uh, backbone for regional and global connectivity? Um, where's Steve Roach when you need him? The, uh, so this is the, I want to be super careful. Let's, whoever asked that question, uh, I want to make sure I answer the question right, which is why I'm not going to ask it, answer it right now. And I also want to resist anybody's or, or deny anybody the ability to say I'm a sales guy that said yes to something that I don't know whether or not I know the answer to. So the the uh, Azure is kind of like the English language that there's an exception to everything. So I don't want to say that you've got access to every resource everywhere coming in off of the Azure network for these HPC resources. Um, we have yet to run into a problem except where perhaps we were bandwidth limited or as it relates to running some of the workflows that may run either in an export controlled fashion or uh, some measure of security because those are separate resources that are uh, in separate regions that select people are able to access. Anything else, Kevin? No other questions right now. Okay, good. All right. Well, then let's. Um, looks like we got about fifteen minutes left. Let's. Uh, there is a, what I do want to make sure that we address. Really, is this notion of uh, refresh cycle. Um, and what that's going to mean relative to how we think of what workflows people will run on what platforms. Um, for, you know, since I've been doing this, there was always a cadence, you know, we used to call it a TikTok, where um, Intel would come out with a, they would come out with a new chip, a new chip architecture, and then two years later, they would have a, an upgrade on that, on that architecture, and that was the talk. And then two years after that was a new platform, and that was the tick. And so we tick tock, tick tock, right? Um, but we, and so there were pretty good gaps between what the uh, what the technology implementations were. That of anything is going to be completely blown up. And so if there's one thing that I would say that if you're trying to figure out how to cost out cloud versus on prem, um, and this is, I'm shooting myself in the foot because I'm adding a cost line to cloud that doesn't exist for on-prem, um, which is that you need to have someone who A, understands the workflows that you've got, uh, and if you're going to run on a single cloud, or even more important, if you're running in multiple clouds, you have to have somebody who is keeping up with, and it's, and it's somebody on your team, not solely dependent upon the vendor, somebody on your team who's going to keep um, an eye on 
what's happening within the cloud providers, both in the infrastructure that they have today, what their roadmaps will be, and that's not just compute, but it's also storage and to a certain extent network. Um, so you're talking about you know, multiple variables, and then also of those uh, configurations and infrastructure that they've got, how much capacity is there going to be and when, right? So this is, you know, certainly 3D checkers, right? In managing this. And if you want to know the single greatest thing that, that my personal opinion, I have been doing this for a long time, the single best way for you to get optimal, um, I was going to say cost performance, but I would say that stretch your budget dollars the absolute furthest is to have somebody who understands the environments that I just described, right? Because for so long, and believe me, it was the, the people that worked for me that had to sit at the table that we knew every time when best and final was coming that the that the real savings that most people experienced on the um, on the on-prem clusters that they were buying really came from what could you do to uh, effectively navigate and negotiate with your vendor to get yourself to the best price, right? Um, because by the time you got there, there wasn't a lot of wiggle room left in the configuration, right? And then also once it was done, it was done. And if there was, you know, somehow something magically happened four months later, because the price of memory went down or whatever else, you know, you didn't get a, a rain check. You didn't get a, a credit check back to say, oh, you know, guess what? You know, if, if you'd only waited four months, we could have saved you this much more money. Cloud gives you the ability to do that, gives you the ability to be very opportunistic. And so then as we circle back around to what the weather question was, do we have enough capacity? That's the other piece is that within weather and climate, we've got research and then we've also got operational. The operational is going to be its own, and that's the UK Met Office is an operational environment, and that is going to be com complex and costly. But on the research side, there are a lot of really smart people that would love to be able to go back through all of the archival data that we've got to see what we can glean out of the past, not just to work on physics-based models, but to answer the other question, to start to feed some of the ML models that we're building is to go back through that. And one of the ways that that's going to happen cost effectively is for organizations to be in a position to take advantage of excess capacity when it's available and go do it either on spot or through something negotiated with the vendor or whatever else where you can do something um, very, very cost effectively because you're running it on infrastructure that would have been idle anyway. So the the cloud provider that you're working with, I mean, I know that we we love to do things like that because typically it's important work that comes out of it too, right? So we're putting infrastructure to work that normally would have been idle. The customer's getting it at a price point that they wouldn't have gotten it um, had they not said, hey, let us know if there's an opportunity to do this. And then we got a good chunk of work done, right? So as you're looking forward at how you're going to calculate this stuff out, I would worry less about the finance person trying to figure out how to squeeze every penny out of the infrastructure cost or the cloud side. And I would task a person to figure out how to stay on top of what's happening within the cloud providers infrastructure, both from a technology roadmap, but a capacity perspective as well. So um, that's my one, uh, that's my one takeaway of a cost that we talk about with customers all the time. Um, and it's not just a cost, it's a, hey, we have to think about creating that position. So if you're really serious that you think the cloud's gonna be part of your, uh, uh, part of your future, that's something to start thinking about either somebody that you've already got in the organization who's interested in doing that or potentially finding somebody um, who's pretty sharp that could grow into it. All right. So just to wrap this up, um, this is the clear as mud part of this. There is no single answer to this. I wish there was a way that we could go that for everybody who called and said, hey, you know, look, I just, I've got a meeting in four days. I'm just trying to put this thing together. You know, I just need, can you just give me the data that says that, you know, how this will run on Azure or whatever else it is. I, I feel, I feel badly for the people that call me because I know 
They're trying to do the right thing, trying to get that data rolled up. Um, but it's just, it's very, very difficult to pull that data together without having some sort of collaborative, truly collaborative, open, transparent session between both cloud vendor and partner or end customer um, to work through those issues together in terms of not only what, but timeline and, and all of those. And, and so you know, that's typically just in terms of getting right people in the room and everything else, um, you know, if you if you want a single answer or need a single answer, you know, that's probably a couple of weeks of working together to get there, to get one that we would feel comfortable standing behind and say, yeah, okay, you now know all the parameters of the answer that we've given you, but we will stand behind that which we have submitted to you. Um, that's virtually impossible to do with an email that says, hey, I just need to know what the cost of running this workflow on these H on these VMs is going to be. Um, but we can get there if we do it together. So. Tim, I do have another question. Sure. So cloud HPC adoption is increasing across multiple industries. However, are you aware of specific industries where customers are still not comfortable for going to uh, for migrating to cloud for any reason? Um, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, when you say industries, I, I want to be careful about uh, categorizing people, categorizing people by industry. It's really more the problem that they're solving, right? And so, public sector uh, customers, whether it's federal government or high ed uh, or university research, they're still really just, uh, uh, it is still a challenge because there is a mismatch between the traditional funding mechanisms, grants, dollar allocation, CapEx, OpEx, I mean, all of those other pieces, there are a whole bunch of non-technical obstacles to being able to go fully implement, right? And so if I'm a researcher, um, and, and I experience this a lot because a lot of these people I've been friends with for a long time, they're very excited about the prospect of going and doing something on Azure that they weren't going to be able to do on-prem. And then, or even we get them a bunch of credits to go do it. And then it becomes this really challenging process to then say, okay, great. So now I'll just, you know, now we just need to convert this to this grant to be able to use. and it's another six months until we're able to get all those things squared away to be able to get up and going operationally, right? And so I've got some friends that are like, look, I'd love to do this in Azure, but I need to have it done by X and it's just easier to use the existing path that I've got right now. I think those things will change. I think that's a nat the nature of the inertia of those particular customer segments. Um, but the, the leadership at the senior most levels of all of the major funding agencies know that the value of cloud is being able to get capacity into the hands of researchers that can't currently get it today. So they're making those adjustments to get to it. Um, some of the other areas where we see some, I'll call it reluctance, which I completely agree with is, is you've got a lot of folks in aerospace, you have a lot of people who are doing work um, within the government where you've got ITAR compliant uh, workflows, export controlled codes. There are a bunch of things where people are just, they're they're not quite there yet on the the comfort level of running those things um, in the clouds that are available. And then the other piece of it too is is it to be sure we actually we absolutely have the secure enclaves that are required to run some of these codes. But then the question becomes, do we have the capacity and the node types that they need, and are they comfortable that we would have them available when they need them? Um, and so we've got. Uh, significant number of proof of concept, uh, test beds, whatever you want to call it, where people know they have the capability to do it. And now we just need to line up the resources that are in behind it. Um, and then beyond that, I would say it's not that you necessarily have industries that are reluctant. I think there's a sliding scale. If you take a look at, um, because of the nature of the workflows lent itself really well to cloud early on, financial services, a lot of the omics, proteomics, genomics, some of those other pieces, they also lent themselves very well to cloud configuration, cloud architectures. They've just been doing it for a long time, right? So they've started to get some of that business operation muscle memory in where they're just good at it now. So it's really part of the mainstream of what they're doing. I put them at the, you know, at the one end of the accept acceptance stream 
uh, or continuum. And then at the other end um, would be the people that have been running um, codes that were either classified or they're operational. Uh, and it is absolutely critical that we get the same answer every single time. And they're just not there yet that the comfort level that the the flexible cloud infrastructure would provide them the same level of consistency and certainty that their dedicated on-prem system does. And then it's just a sort of a stream between the just a, a continuum between the two in terms of where they of where people sit on that scale. So that's what we got. Anything else, Kevin? Yeah, one more, and I think this is probably the, the last one we have time for. So in terms of HPC plus AI, what do you think of multi-cloud strategies? <laughs> uh, could we maybe throw two or three other things in there just to make it even more complicated? <laughs> I can uh, add to it if you want. I'm, I'm going to break it into, I'm going to break it into two, to two parts. Um, I'll just say that the, uh, and, and Kevin is for marketing, and so I'll I'll get the emails after this afterwards. Like I think anybody that's been in this space for a long time that knows that ultimately it's about getting the work done, knows that we are headed to a multi-cloud world, right? So yes, for some organizations, it's going to be a mandate from purchasing. They're not going to allow themselves to be beholden to a single cloud provider. So I don't think it's a question of whether or not you do multi-cloud or whether you're only in one cloud or anything. I think the real that what is more important is, are you going to try and eat the whole elephant in one bite, or are you going to do this one at a time? Are you going to try to build out this infrastructure that you say, okay, well, we're going to start from nothing, and we're going to go straight from nothing to hybrid burst into multi-cloud, right? That's pretty complicated, right? Because the other thing that happens and we've all been there with all, I mean, it's not just cloud, it's anything that we ever do, that the more that you homogenize something to be able to operate in multiple environments, what happens is you abstract out or you um, limit the ability to truly take advantage of the things that make something really performant or really advantageous, right? And so in, in terms of looking at multi-cloud, don't give up the value of cloud in order to run multi-cloud. Right, so that that would be that piece, and then the I, the AI piece. I just think that um, uh, that what's happening, what we're seeing anyway, in terms of demand forecast and talking to customers, is that um, most of the people, a lot of the AI and ML stuff, they're starting in the cloud, right? They might they might get a a, a rack of uh, of GPUs or something on prem in order to get themselves going and do the dev work, um, but for the most part, people are already going in just assuming that they're going to run in cloud because the GPUs they refresh they refresh even faster than the CPUs. I mean the everything about you know that we talk about cloud in terms of being fluid and everything else uh, GPU is at the is at the end of that extreme, right? And so the customers are looking at it and saying, "Hey, look, if I have the ability to do what I need to do, I'm already factoring it in my cost equations. I don't want to call it cloud native, but it's like, hey, we're just going to go straight to cloud." Um, and not complicate ourselves because we're really just focusing on the work. All right, Kevin, minute 35. Minute, okay, well, can you answer this one then quickly? Yeah. Do you see customers running their entire workload in the cloud? Uh, there are a bunch of people that are doing it today. Um, if you take a look at, uh, and, and it's, th this is my perspective because it's what my actual day job is, but also, uh, it's my passion, but take a look at the weather tech, as it's now being called, all of the climate-based companies that are starting up. There's a lot of investment money that's flowing into it. Um, virtually all of those startups um, are running on huge infrastructure because they're running big physics-based models, uh, and they do not have a server in their building. Right, they're starting. They are running all in cloud. But what's absolutely critical, and it's a great way to end this conversation, is that they don't have an on-prem versus cloud conversation because they have no on-prem. And the people that are giving them money to go build out the company don't want them building out ginormous data centers. They want them generating answers that then provide other solutions. And so you're going to see more and more of these companies that are doing everything in cloud, and you're going to get you be able to use them as data points from a cost basis going forward. So good question. So 
Last thing that I would leave you with is the great thing is, is Microsoft has a bunch of people that love having these conversations with you. Um, if you would like to, please reach out through your account team um, and we're happy to engage.